Matthew chapter number 11, please, and verse number 1. <coughs> Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 1. Matthew 11 and verse number 1, and we'll read through verse number, uh, verse number 12. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 1, we'll read through verse number 12, and verses, uh, verse number 12 will be the text verse for this morning's message. So if you found that, Matthew chapter 11, verse number 1, you can stand with me, please, out of respect for the Word of God. And I'll read aloud as you read in your Bible silently, Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent to his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses, or on the Richard Simmons show. But, verse number 9, but what went ye out for to see? Here's what happened. Look at me for just a second. I'll keep reading. What happened was John the Baptist was in prison. He got thrown in prison. He's sort of doubting. He's sort of confused. He's thinking, man, if I'm serving God and I'm preaching Jesus Christ, he's the son of God, um, what am I doing in prison? I'm supposed to be out preaching somewhere. Here I am in prison. He's sort of down on his luck, discouraged. It happens to everybody. So he sends a couple of his friends, his disciples, and he says, go see Jesus and check with him again and say, are you the one that was supposed to come? Or are we? Are you not? And we're supposed to wait for another. Could you clarify this for me? So a bunch of people hear that happen. So Jesus tells the disciples, go back and tell John what you've seen. The deaf get their uh, hearing and the blind receive their sight and lepers are cleansed. And the poor have the gospel preached to them and the, the, the maimed are, are healed. Go, go tell John what you've seen. So they go tell John. And I think there's a little bit of murmur and all the people saying, man, you, John. John's shaking, and John's doubting the Lord Jesus. And Jesus then begins to protect and defend John the Baptist in verse number 8 and verse number 9. So verse, let me read verse 9 again. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? So he's defending John the Baptist here. Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And then here's the text verse. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And I'm going to I bring a message entitled this morning, The Victory Goes to the Violent. The Victory Goes to the Violent. Father, we love you. We need you. Thank you for the, uh, the King James Bible. And thank you how it was written in another language. And, and English wasn't even spoken then or written. And, and how words can have so much depth and so much meaning. Thank you for all the people through the years who have written uh, books about the words of the Bible and the things that we can get from. Thank you that we live in a day and age uh, where we have access to so much information. Thank you that the gospel is preached throughout the world. Thank you that many people are being saved. Lord, I believe all over the world today there will be uh, uh, Bible-believing preachers and teachers and Sunday school teachers and, and just, just old-fashioned folks who are going to stand up around the world and take a Bible and talk about your love and about uh, the death of thy son and people, thousands and millions maybe, will be saved today. God, if there's anybody here that's not saved, you know their heart, you know their mind, you know their soul. You know that they need you, uh, dear Lord Jesus. They need you in their life so they can live forever and not go to hell. Please impress that upon them today. Please help them to see their need of thee, how they're empty without thee, and that they need you. And then will they accept you as Savior. And then others here, Lord, help them to listen to this message carefully. Those that are saved, know they're saved and trying to live the Christian life. Help them to get a truth that will help them today. We ask you to help us. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. The victory goes to the violent. I don't think I'll be long this morning. It's 
quarter of that clock is 11.37. I may be done by 12, maybe a few minutes after. I want you to listen carefully. Let me explain a few of these words to you. I'll help you. I have read this. How many of you ever read Matthew 11 in your whole life? How many of you ever read these verses here? How many of you honestly said, I'm not quite understanding what that means. Would you be honest with me? All right. I, I, I've read it many times, and I, I sort of just passed over it. Here's what I always thought. I just looked at it and said, it must mean that it must mean that there's vi- people are violent against people trying to get saved and trying to serve God. That's what I thought. I thought it must mean persecution and martyrdom and attacks on people, you know, especially in the old days uh, that are trying to live for the Lord. Well, I was reading over this again, and it, it, I don't like reading stuff I can't understand. And I, I read it again, and I, I didn't quite understand these words when it says, um, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. So I decided, I decided to sit down and look at these words. What, what do you think suffer means? Hurt, pain, right? That's what we think, suffering. But in the, in the New Testament, most of the times when you read the word suffer, it means allow. And Jesus says, suffer it to be so. When the uh, soldiers came to get him in the garden as he was praying the night before the uh, crucifixion, the, day, the night before the trial and the crucifixion, the Soldiers came to get him, and they were getting ready to get him. A few of the fellows wanted to defend him, Peter uh, specifically. And Jesus said, no, 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 uh, suffer it to be so, or allow it to be so. Jesus uh, one time was uh, sitting by the wayside, and he was talking and teaching people. And uh, some folks brought, brought some children. And the word there is braphos, B-R-A-P-H-O-S, which means infants. So uh, some folks brought some small infant. I would say infant would be what, one years old and down? You used to call them a toddler when they get about two or three. So some, some people, maybe some mothers and fathers, brought their infants or their one-year-old and down babies to Christ that he would just, I guess, pray for them or ask God to bless them. I'm not sure what the meaning, all, all it was. And the disciples said, no, 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 he's too busy for that. And Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. So I got to thinking about this, realizing that word suffereth means alloweth. All right, let's read it that way. Let, let me read it that way. So the Bible says, until now the kingdom of heaven alloweth violence all right so we've got that word right alloweth violence and the violent take it by force all right i knew what the word force meant i I learned that about force plus mass equals work or something like that i don't remember but i know force means effort looked it up it means effort it means work it means concentrated energy all right so now let's read it that way so the kingdom of heaven verse 12 the kingdom of heaven alloweth violence and the violent take it by effort, work, and concentrated energy. Now, I sat there and kept looking at it saying, I'm still not understanding this, but the kingdom of heaven, who owns the king, who lives in the kingdom of heaven? Who, 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 who's the boss? Who's the king of the kingdom of heaven? Can somebody steal the kingdom of heaven from God? Would God allow someone to steal the kingdom of heaven from him? So I sat there looking at it saying, it can't mean what I assumed that it's mean all this time. So I got out my... Uh, New Testament, Greek New Testament, and I looked up that word uh, uh, violent. I looked up that word violent. Here's what that word violent means. Uh, here's, what, here's what it says. So it's got all these different words, and it's, I mean, it's, to, this is right. It says, some believe that the reference of violence is to the antagonism of the enemies of the kingdom of heaven, but the middle voice, which is a, is a verb tense in the Greek, entereth violently, indicates the meaning of as referring to those, get this, who make an effort to enter the kingdom of heaven in spite of violent opposition against them. And that's what it means. Uh, I read it in another place, and the different, I'm not going to give you the word, but one, one word is called uh, biazo, another word is called harpezo, the Greek words. Here's, here's what it means. It says, the violent take it by force, the meaning being, as de- determined by the preceding clause, that those who are possessed of eagerness and determination and zeal, instead of yielding to the opposition of religious uh, of religion and religious foes, such as the scribes and Pharisees, force their way into the kingdom of God so they can pos- be possessors of it themselves. So here's what that verse means. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven allows for desperate people forcing their way to Christ in order to be saved. 
Now, as I looked at that and looked at that and looked at that, I got to thinking, that's exact, and if you read a few more verses, we're not going to it, but, but verse 14, it says, if you receive it, that is a life which was to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him, let him hear. He says, if you're going to understand it, you better think this thing through. When you look these things up, you find out that that word, violent, means desperate. Desperate. Now, this statement has been heard, desperate times call for desperate measures. I read, I read books a lot, and maybe some of you have heard about the Donner Party. And some of you have heard about the different places where people resort to cannibalism in order to survive. Where people would do desperate things when it's a desperate times call for desperate measures. And the majority of people who come to Christ or who came to Christ in the Gospels were desperate people. No one who was desperate ever came to Christ and came away empty-handed. No one ever came to Christ and went away empty-handed who came desperately. And I think the problem with modern day, I don't know the problem, but one of the problems with uh, modern day Christianity, and maybe one of the problems with myself sometimes, is I'm not desperate enough to see God do something in my life. Matthew 15, 21 says this, and you not turn there. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Watch this. But he answered her not a word. Hey, that doesn't mean he wasn't listening. She came desperately seeking help for her daughter who was grievously vexed with the devil and cried out after him. And the Bible says he didn't even answer, but it doesn't mean he wasn't listening. He wanted to see if she was desperate, amen? Look, God, if you come up to God and say, hey, God, you can do it or you cannot do it, you can probably count on God not doing it. When you come to God desperately, God oftentimes will answer your prayer. And that's why the Bible says the kingdom of heaven allows for concentrated energy and concentrated zeal and desperately pushing into the throne of grace. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews. It says, let us come boldly before the throne of God. Let us come desperately before the throne of God and call out to our king and get the help that we need. Amen. Amen. You better believe amen. The victory goes to the violent. And she came, and the Bible says he answered not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away. Bunch of stupid disciples. You know, there's people like that in churches sometimes. Amen. Send her away, she cries after us. She just, they didn't understand the, the, the God Almighty. They didn't understand Jesus. She came begging. Christ didn't respond. The Bible says he answered her not a word. And the disciples just assumed, well, he's not answering. He must not want to be bothered. He, that's not a mad point of him being bothered. By the way, I don't think you can ever bother Jesus unless you complain all the time. You can't bother him with your constant coming. You don't bother God when you come desperately seeking help. Amen. The victory goes to the violence. And his Bible says, the disciples came and said, get her off our back, man. She cries after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent. He talked to her, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not right. It's not meat for me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, that's right, Lord. She said, truth, Lord. Yep, I agree with that. But even the dogs, these are crumbs which fall from the master's table. She said, Lord, you don't have to do anything big for me if you just knock a few crumbs off your table. It'll be enough to heal my daughter, which is grievously vexed by a devil. Amen. Amen. And Jesus said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Sounds like a desperate woman to me. Amen. Sounds like she was desperate for help for her daughter. Her daughter could not come for herself, but she was desperate to get help from the heavenly father a desperate woman in mark chapter 5 you need not turn there but in mark chapter 5 the bible says and behold there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue jairus by name and when he saw him saw christ he fell at his feet and besought him greatly begged him saying my little daughter life at the point of death i pray thee i beg thee come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live and jesus went with him and as he went much people followed him the bible says and crowded around him and thronged him and a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years she had an internal hemorrhage for 12 years and she had suffered many things of many uh, physicians and has spent all that she had she was broke by the way li listen carefully don't you give all your money or some psychiatrist or some even some doctor until you at least take it up with jesus christ first before you give all your money to the therapist before you give all your money sometimes i'll read i read the comic pages a lot and on the same uh, section 
like uh, what they call Timpo section, the same section, there'll be uh, Dear Abby and Dear Julie and Dear Hannah and Dear Margie and all this stuff. And so I say, I've been in therapy 20 years. 20 years I've been in therapy. Now, I'm not going to be sarcastic. You say, don't you think that lady's stupid? No, I feel sorry for that lady. I have compassion for that lady because she's been told that therapy would help her. 20 years in therapy. I guess if you went once, let's say once a week and you paid, let's go cheap. Let's say it's a cut rate. Let's say he got his diploma from IU or somewhere, all right? And uh, uh, $100 an hour, $50 an hour, what is that, $2,600 a year? 10 years is 26000 20 years is $52,000. Plus all the books and seminars. And she said, and she basically says, and I'm nothing better. And that's what the Bible says here. A certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years had suffered from physicians and analysts and all these people. Spent all that she had was nothing better, but rather grew worse. She wasn't getting better. She's getting worse. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press, came in the crowd behind him, snuck up and touched his garment. For she said to herself, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway or immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? People crowding all around him. I mean, people bumping into him and people tugging at him and people pushing on him. And he turns around in a big old crowd of people and says, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, what kind of question is that? His disciples said, man, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou, who touched me? And he looked round about. Jesus always has the right answer. These disciples don't hardly ever have the right answer. You don't ever have the right answer. I don't either have the right answer all the time. But Jesus always has the right answer. Man. These were disciples. They never understood. Here a lady comes and says, help me, Jesus. Help me. Help me. He doesn't answer. And the disciples say, man, send her away. Get her out of here. She's bothering us. Uh, people bring their little infants and they love their children and they bring their little children to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, just pray for him. And someday I want to be able to tell my little child when, when he or she grows up that the Messiah held you in his arms. And the disciples say, get them little children out of here. Don't you see we're, we're doing big miracles around here. We have time for little babies around here. This lady comes to him and, and uh, uh, cries after him. And the disciples say, man, who touched you? How can you ask such a question? Folks, listen to me. The world doesn't have the answers. But Christ always has the answers. And he always has time for those that are desperate. We just have to get desperate. Just have to get desperate. The problem with Christianity is there's not enough desperate Christians. The problem in marriages is because there's not enough desperate husbands. And desperate wives. The problem with parents is there are not enough desperate parents to raise their children right. The problem with some of you children is you're not desperate enough to turn out for God. God always has time for desperate people. God always has time for a desperate preacher boy. God always has time for a weeping, desperate mother crying for children. God always has time for a desperate father begging God to cast the demon out of the poor boy as he's thrown into the fire as the bible tells us in mark chapter 9 the man with the demon possessed son was desperate and cried out to him and this lady says he looked around the bible says he looked around to see her that had done this thing but the woman fearing and trembling knowing what was done in her came and fell down before him and told him all the truth and he said unto her daughter thy faith hath made thee whole go in peace and be whole of thy plague now you got the story a man comes to rule the synagogue he says lord come and heal my daughter she's ready to die as he goes, a woman comes up and says, touches him, and so that's one. He's still on his way. This happened as he, as he travels. So this, this story's still going on. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, which said to him, thy daughter is dead. Why trouble thou the master any further? You talk about desperate. He, it was over now. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered aloud. He allowed no man to follow him except Peter, save, which means except, Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he comes to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and sees the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Listen. And they laughed him to scorn. You know, when you're desperate enough, you don't care if people laugh at you. Amen. When you're desperate enough, you don't care about what they say at work. When you're desperate enough, you don't care what they say on the team. 
When you're desperate enough, you don't care what they write in the newspaper. When you're desperate enough, you don't care what your brothers and sisters say. When you're desperate enough, you don't care what your friends say. By the way, friends don't laugh at you. I'm so sick of this stuff about, well, I'm trying to go save, but my friends won't let me. They're not your friends for the 15,000th time. They're not your friends. Amen? They're not your friends if they'll pull you away from that's right. They're not your friends if they'll take you away from God. They're not your friends if they pull you back to drug abuse. They're not your friends if they pull you back to adultery. They're not your friends if they take you away from God. It's about time Christians, I said Christians, I said Christians, wake up and realize who your friends are. Buddy, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. The violent, listen to me. Some of you folks ought to get violent. Not fight, but the word desperate. Amen. Amen. I said, boy, preacher, you fired up this morning. Well, I guess after 23 years of serving God, I plan on staying fired up. Listen, folks, I'm old enough now not to have heard Brother Howe preach about it, not to have heard uh, uh, Les Thoreau preach about it, but I'm old enough now to have seen God do it. Amen. I'm not just telling you what I heard somebody say. I'm not just telling you what I read in a book. I'm telling you what I've seen for 22, almost 23 years. Amen. The violent, the violent, the victory goes to the violent. You know I like violence anyway. Amen. In this context, the kingdom of heaven allows desperate people and the desperate take it by force. Amen. By concentrated energy, not turned away. And the Bible says they all laughed at him. They laughed him to scorn. He put all them out. He took the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him, entering in where the damsel was laying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Makumai, which means, yo, get up. Which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. Hey, this guy was desperate and he got what he wanted. In Luke chapter 18, you'll read about a little widow woman that kept going to an unjust judge and going to him and going to him and going to him. Finally, the unjust judge gave her what she needed, and God said, you know what? That's like you praying to me. I'll give you what you need if you're just desperate enough. In Luke chapter 17, the Bible says lepers, 10 lepers were healed and cleansed of their leprosy. Why? Because they cried after Christ because they were desperate enough to get healed. In Mark chapter 9, the man with the demon-possessed son was desperate and says he cried out. Blind Bartimaeus on the Jericho Road. The Bible says he was desperate and he cried out. Folks, we must be desperate enough to want God to do some things for us. Are you listening to me? Did you hear me? It's time some of us get desperate enough to see God do some things for us and desperate enough to want to do some things for God. Listen, I'm not going to be personal here, but stop telling me why your bus route runs 10. I'm going to tell you why your bus route runs 10 because you're not desperate enough to see it run 50. I'm sick and tired of hearing it. Why, you can't do it. Well, it's the neighborhood. You know what? I was in a better neighborhood than all these neighbors put together in the south side of Chicago. I was told with John yesterday. We, some Spanish guys. I, I, as soon as we walked over there, they ran back in the house. I said, I know what they They think we're cops or immigration or something. Went over and knocked on their door and, and had a Spanish track and, and witnessed to them in Spanish. He kept saying, um, la gloria, el suya, y decision, el inferno. What am I saying? It's heaven or it's hell and it's your choice. Open it up. And I know what the verses say. I know what Apocalypse uh, 320 is. Revelation 320. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, I'll enter in and come, come into him. Amen. Read that in Spanish. What did it say? And pressed it and pressed it and pressed it and pressed it. Went to Soul Wind yesterday and signed up a bunch of kids on a bus ride. You say, well, I can't get anybody safe. You're not desperate enough to see somebody get safe. Now, you stop saying you can't. You stop saying you can't. You stop saying you can't. Yes, you can. You are just not desperate enough. Amen. Hello, preacher. Thank you for preaching the truth today. Amen. How desperate are we to see our children turn out for God? Hey, how desperate are you to see your marriage succeed? How desperate are you not to end up in the Lord's court? It used to be 10%, then 20%, then 30%, then 40%, then 50%. Now, 60% of people to get married get divorced. How desperate are you? Desperate enough to shut your big, fat, stupid, arguing mouth? Go ahead and get mad. I don't care. 
Because I'm desperate enough to teach, preach the truth. Desperate enough. My wife and I hadn't had a fight in two months. You know why? Because I quit being a big stinking jerk. That's why. My wife's not a jerk. My wife's not a problem. My wife's compassionate and she's tender. Sometimes she says stuff she ought not say and, and I don't like that. But, but, uh, 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 but you know what? The problem is not her. The problem is me. Amen. I'm sick and tired of marriage just falling apart. Shut your mouth and say, are you desperate? If you're not desperate, then go and get divorced. Go ahead. Let Junior can stay with this time, and then they can go this time, and then go this time. And guess what? The kids will grow up all dysfunctional, and that'll be because they have attention deficit disorder. No, it'll be because you weren't desperate enough. Would to God my mom and dad would have been desperate enough to succeed. My dad graduated from Bible college. J. Frank North, one of the greatest preachers, if not the greatest preacher of this century. He and Brother Hiles, neck and neck. Both of them, incredible churches. Incredible preachers. Wake up, Mike. Incredible preachers. My dad graduated from there. Worked in as a superintendent of a church. It was choir director, music director, Sunday school superintendent. Went to start a church, but because his wife, not my mother, his wife left him as he started a church in New Orleans, Louisiana, he quit. He said, well, I guess if this is the price i got to pay, I won't pay it. Would to God my dad had been desperate enough to keep pushing on, whether the wife stayed or the wife left. What we need is desperation, the violent, take it by force. Victory goes to the violent. Are you violent enough? Well, I'm nonviolent. Yeah, you're probably non-competitive too. You probably don't care how your kids turn out. You're going to let MTV raise them. You're going to let rap music raise them. You're going to let Snoop Dogg Dogg teach them the philosophy of life. Amen. Hey, you can let Britney Spears show them what true beauty is. And then they're going to grow up miserable because they're two pounds overweight. Hello. You ought to put your stinking boot through that TV if that's what's raising your child. You ought to go home and throw out every one of those CDs and every one of those tapes, parents. Well, I just don't know what to do. I'm telling you what to do right now today. Listen, folks. Say, well, you know, if I could have my teenage daughter, let me tell you what your teenage daughter do. She'd get a little upset. She'd get a little mad. But if ever she got up late night and she didn't drink water, she walked by your bedroom door. If she heard you in there, then I'd say, oh, God, I haven't done it right so far. I, it's all my fault that Susie's messed up. I haven't done it right. God, help me. Oh, God, I love you so much. God, I want to please you. God, I want to live for you. If she can hear that about three or four times a month, she might not get so mad. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Hello, Pastor. Thanks for showing up today. Come on. Amen. Are we desperate enough to make our help our children turn out? Are we desperate enough? By the way, I don't want my kids to turn out like the guy. I don't want my kid turning out like Britney Spears. I don't want my kid turning out like Michael Jackson. I don't want my kid turning out like Nick Nolte or Clint Eastwood. I don't want my kid having a foul mouth like Eddie Murphy or Robin Williams. I don't want my kid having a foul mouth like some of these stink rock stars, 60 years old, flabby, ugly, wrinkled. They're still out there playing. It's like, dude, leave the lead guitar to the 25-year-old dude, okay? He can jam. You can't. Go home and get in a rocking chair. Mick Jagger, the ugliest man in the face of the earth. Of course, I've been told I look like him, but... Uh, <clears throat> Nobody ever says, oh, Pastor, you look like it's always you look like. Your eyes are like Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> you got lips like Mick Jagger. You know what? You got eyelashes like a woman. Okay, that's enough. How desperate are we? Hey, how desperate are we to win somebody to Christ? How desperate are Look, how desperate are we not to be pulled back to the old crowd, the old ways, the old life, and the old sins? Now, you don't have to do it my way. But I got saved, I was, a, I was immersed in, in sin. All my friends, we, we were poker playing, bar hopping, dope smoking, alcohol drinking. You, you just, that's what we were. I mean, from the age of about 15, I ran away from home and then joined the Navy at 17 until the time I was 22. That's what we were. That's what we were. And my friends wanted to keep having me come back to it, come back to it. And after a time or two of me saying, no, Tim, I don't do that anymore. No, Daryl, I don't do that anymore. No, Jeff, I'm not smoking weed with you anymore. After a while, they said, well, it'll wear off. No, it ain't going to wear off. And don't, don't tempt me anymore. Don't ask me anymore. And after a couple of times, not 15 times, 
Not after they'd come over and I'd barely, you know, make a bunch of excuses. Well, it's okay for you and you can do it if you want to. And I'm not saying you're wrong and, and you know, trying to get them out the door. And then they leave and go, man, I was awful tempted. After about the second or third time, I'd be like, look, pal, do you not understand what I'm saying? Here, let me speak real slow. I'm not dropping acid. You understand that? If you come over here one more time with it, I'm going to punch you in your face. Now, I dare you, Jeff, walk in my door and try and get me to smoke dope again. I dare you. And if you want to throw down now, we'll throw down right now. What do you want to do? You say, preacher, but, but I'm just not getting me. Were you going to make it 23 years? You're going to act like this 23 years? Boy, I'm more fired up today than I was 23 years ago. Because I said, you're not my friend. If you're my friend, you won't keep trying to pull me back. Well, I don't want to offend them. I could care less if I offend them. The violent get it by the victory comes by violence. Hello? The kingdom of heaven allows for desperate people to force their way in. No, I'm not drinking. No, I'm not going out with you, hussy. Hey, I'm talking about before I was married. I'm talking about when I got saved and old girlfriends would call and talk dirty to me. I'd say, you know what? I don't even know you anymore, quick. But, but, but you were single. Didn't you have manly needs? Yeah, I had a manly need to live for God. It's about time some of you man, you men, decide it's more manly to live for God than to fornicate. Amen. Hello, pastor. You probably they thought they were getting love and gumdrops this morning. Amen. How desperate are we not to be pulled back? How desperate are we? All I have to do is, all I have to do any day is roll that sleeve up and look at my arms and see some little faint scars still on my arms. And they, they weren't bee stings. They're needle marks. Well, I pressed the needle in those veins hundreds of times and hundreds of times. I don't know if they do that now. I don't know if people still use needles in drugs, but we did back then. It was real popular. Right after Woodstock, right after Hate Ashbury, in the early 70s and mid 70s, needles were popular. We'd boil anything. I mean, we'd boil acid, we'd boil THC, we'd boil uh, mescaline, we'd, we'd fire that stuff up. All I have to do any day is roll up my sleeve and look at that. I said, I ain't going back to that. You think, don't tempt me, man. Don't try and drag me back, because the way I see it, you're trying to throw a noose around my neck and let you pull me back to the heartbeat. You better get out of my front yard with a rope, boy. I'll put it around your neck. Yeah, we'll smoke some weed. Go ahead, give me the bag. I'll roll one. Run to the bathroom, jump in the toilet, smudge. My bad. Well, they might get mad. I hope they do. They want to come back to your house again. You say, well, I just don't see myself doing that. I see you doing that. If the victory comes with the violence, you're going to have to press in to the kingdom of God. Buddy, Jesus spent his time with desperate. The thing is, we don't want to admit we're desperate. We don't want to confess we're desperate. We think it's a sign of weakness. We think it's a sign of weakness to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and say, Dear God, dear God, help me. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me at work today. God, help me not to be tempted. Oh, God, help me not to fall. Oh, God, help my tongue not to take thy name in vain. Oh, God, help my eyes not to look upon that which is my... Oh, God, we think it's a sign of weakness. And, of course, Americans can't be weak. We're big, strong Americans. Well, the Bible says Jesus spent his ministry with desperate people. With the blind, with the lame, with the lepers, with the poor, with the sinners. Jesus wants to be desperate enough to listen to what he says and then do it. We've got a saying, one of our principles in our RU, Reformers Unanimous. Here it is. If God's against it, so am I. If God's against it, so am I. I said, if God's against it, so am I. But if I want God to be for me and my children and my marriage and my finances and my home and my health and my life, if I want God to be for me, then I better be for him. And I can't be for him unless I'm against what, uh, unless I'm for what he's for and against what he's against. Jesus said, he that's not with me is against me. The story tells here about how he went to heal this uh, uh, ruler of the synagogue's daughter. He gets up there and says, well, y'all, you know, the guy came and said, hey, don't tell the master, she's dead. And he says, don't, don't worry, you just believe, we'll see what happens. Buddy, I'll take Jesus' world over everybody in the world. And Jesus said, don't worry, it's going to work out. So they go in there, Jesus, the mother, the father, James, John, and Peter. And he says, why weep ye and make much ado? The, dead is, the, the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And the Bible says they laughed him to scorn. You know what, teenagers? If you ever decide to live for God in your school, they might laugh at you to scorn. They might laugh at you. They might mock you. They might make fun of you. They might call you religious girl. They might knock the Bible out of your hand. They might put X666 on the front of your 
Bible at the public school. They might do all kinds of things, but bless God, you just listen to what Jesus says, and Jesus says, go to work. They may laugh you to scorn at the workplace. Go ahead, take your Bible and put it out there. Take your Bible and put it out there. Put on a tape of, of Brother Hiles preaching, or me, if you want to scare him. Put on a tape of some preaching. Put on some tape of some Christian music. And they may laugh you to scorn. And they may say, you'll be back, John. You'll be back, Bob. You'll be back, Mike. You'll be back, Frank. You'll be back, Doug. You'll be back to the world. It won't last. And every day you say, one day more behind me. One day more behind me. If God's against it, so am I. If God's against it, so am I. If God's against it, so am I, man. Yes, you can make it. They laughed him to scorn. And Jesus said, all right, well, y'all going to laugh about it. Y'all stay out of there. Y'all come on in here. And he went in there and suddenly said, babe, I thank thee, arise. I wonder how much laughing there was when she came walking out of the room. I wonder how much ho, ho, ha, ha, ha at the funny little Christians there were when she came walking out the door. I bet all the laughing stopped, amen. I bet it stopped right now. And we can go back to any of my old friends and any of my old buddies and even some of my relatives, and they, they're not laughing anymore. They're not doubting anymore. They're not wondering if Doug's going to make it anymore. Amen. No, because they're not. And when they wondered when I'd make it through college, well, I made it. It took seven years, but I made it. And people doubted that I'd come over here and start a church. And I left our home and left the business and left a secure place and a safe place. And, I mean, I hate to say this, but I just said, bless God, I'm desperate enough to do God's will. I'm desperate enough to establish a soul winning church. I'm desperate enough to do it. And even though pastors in this town said it couldn't be done, and even though some friends I had, even though people at Hiles Air said, Doc, you're kind of old, you got a lot of kids, you, you, maybe you better not do that. I was desperate enough to obey the Bible, and now there's a church. 35, 36,000 people saved, or no, 31,000 in the last 10 years, amen? That's a whole lot of people not going to hell. That's, right. That's everybody in New Haven, everybody in Columbus City, and everybody in Rome City, amen? All those people, that many people combined. Why? Right, because I was desperate enough to do it. It can't be done. Oh, well, somebody's going to be desperate enough to do it. I ought to be church to start all over America if all the preachers that were called of God would get desperate enough to do it. Oh, I, I know what I was going to do. I was going to sit on my blessed shirt and let, let Brandy go to hell. That was a good place. I was going to stay home and let Mrs. Gibson and Travis and Lisa just, just go on about their life, the rest of their life, and never hear the gospel of everything say. All I was going to do, I was thinking about Miss Tiggins the other day. You know how many people have been saved in Miss Tiggins' family? Sisters in laws and brothers and sons and, and uh, mom and stepdad and all these people. I was, you know, I was just going to stay at home. I'm just going to stay at home, run my little drywall business. Look, folks, you got to be desperate enough to do something for God if you're going to see something get done. You can be sure people will be against you. You can be sure people will mock. Always some Pharisees and scribes mocking and scoffing and ridiculing and questioning and doubting. Jesus would preach in the synagogues, and they'd all get angry and want to kill him. Amen? Nobody ever got saved when he preached at the synagogue because they were all, look, I ain't going to preach at First Presbyterian Church. They won't get saved. Them bunch of abortionists and homosexuals, they're not getting saved. They might get saved if they came to this church. But if I wouldn't go to their pulpit and preach, if they called me down there and said they'd get, look, if they said you come preach for us on, on Sunday morning, we'll give you $50,000, I wouldn't go. I would. There's no money. There ain't a price tag. You can put it on it. I'm not going. Why? Because I'm desperate enough to want to see something happen in somebody's heart. Jesus would go preach to them. Nobody gets saved. Yet five, that, how can a pastor stand up and say it's okay to have abortion? Look, look, you say, I don't know how they can do that. I do. He's lost. He's lost. He's not saved. No saved man stands up and says, it's okay to have an abortion. It's a murder. You say, preacher, man, don't say that because I did that back when I was a kid or I did that last year. I did that 10 years ago. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And he shall surely give you rest. I don't care what you've done. His blood washes you clean. Amen. Yet 5,000 or 10 or 20 or 30,000 would follow him. Why? They were desperate. Self-satisfied people, not desperate. Self-sufficient people, not desperate. Now, why don't you say this today? Why do I care if people scoff at me? Why do I care what my boyfriend thinks? Why do I care what my girlfriend thinks? Why don't you get desperate enough? What do you care about people who don't love God? What do you care what they think about you? 
Dude, to me, that's like, I mean, that, that doesn't make sense to me. This person doesn't love God. They don't fear God. And you care what they think about you? You got to be kidding me, man. You don't love God. You're not for God. I want you to like me because I want to win you to Christ. But I sure don't care if you laugh at me, mock me, and scorn me. Hello. How about getting desperate today, folks, for your marriage? I'm done. How about getting desperate today for your children? How about getting desperate today for lost loved ones? Man, how about getting desperate? Desperate for your Sunday school class. Desperate for your marriage to be happy instead of fighting all the time. Desperate for your church to grow. Desperate for people to be saved. Desperate for God to help you with your finances. Let's just get desperate enough to see our kids turn out right. Desperate teenagers to do right. Desperate kids to set an example to public school. Desperate to violence. Press us into it. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent press into it. The victory goes to the violent. Let's pray. But before they come, uh, I want to introduce this uh, message to you before I even have you stand up. <coughs> Explain a little bit about it to you. It's found in the Old Testament, and back when there were, uh, the kingdom had been divided, so uh, Israel had been divided into the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom was known as the kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom was known as the kingdom of Israel. Uh, therefore, they each had a king over them. The northern kingdom was usually uh, a wicked kingdom. The southern kingdom was usually the kingdom that followed God. Those kings would uh, followed followed after the Lord. Well, the king of the southern portion was named Jehoshaphat. The king of the northern portion was a man named Ahab. He of uh, the Jezebel wife fame, and that was his main claim to fame. He was married to a woman named Jezebel. It was very wicked. Well, there was a, an area, it was called Ramoth Gilead. It was, a, it was a desirous area. The Syrians had captured it. And so Ahab sent a message down to this man named Jehoshaphat in the southern kingdom and said, look, uh, we need to bind together. You can't capture it alone. I can't capture it alone. But if we join forces together in an, in an alliance, uh, we can go together and we can capture Ramoth and Gilead. And he sent a message. He said, why are we still? He said, we be still. He said, know ye not that Ramoth and Gilead is ours and we be still and take it not. Now, Jehoshaphat followed the true God. Ahab and Jezebel worshipped false gods. Baal was who, was who they worshipped. And Jehoshaphat should not have allied himself with Ahab. But he did. He, he, he did it anyway. And so they went down to battle. In the battle... Uh, uh, they end up not capturing Ramoth and Gilead, and uh, they're, uh, one of the kings is slain, and that king that's slain is named Ahab. And so I want you to stand to your feet now. You know the story. Look at verse 33, and I'll read verse 33 and 34. I don't want, uh, otherwise I would have had to read just about the whole chapter to you. Verse 33 and verse 34, here's what the Bible says. And a certain man drew a bow at a, <laughs> at a venture, and that means he wasn't, he didn't even know who he was shooting at. He just said, hey, there's a whole flock of them running away. I'm going to nail somebody. So a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. So he, he was wearing armor, but where the armor joined together, it would have little round rings that held together. It, that, that, that divinely appointed arrow went through the air, maybe hundreds of yards, and flew down as Ahab was uh, driving his uh, uh, chariot away, or he was being driven away in his chariot. That arrow flew all the way and went right through. I mean, it could have been an area about that big. Went right through the joints of the harness. Verse 33 he says, Therefore he said to his chariot man, Turn thy hand, and that thou mayest carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day. Howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the even. And about the time of the sun going down, he died. I want to talk to you tonight about the casualties and fatalities casualties and fatalities father we love you we need you i sure need you so god helps me people tonight as they <coughs> grow <coughs> in grace help them to listen to this message and and the easy points to remember and a simple message uh, uh from from a simple a preacher to a simple folk god help us to apply this truth help us to dig in and get what we learn and learn what we get and then apply it in our lives so we do not become fatalities in the Christian warfare. We ask these things in Jesus' holy, special name. Amen. This morning got a little wound up there. Amen.
and I don't think I will tonight. I just want to talk to you about casualties and fatalities in the Christian warfare. Casualties and fatalities. There's a man named Tom Vogel who teach. Oh, you like that name, Tom? Tom Vogel, Doubting Thomas. Uh, Dr. Tom Vogel, he teaches, uh, he's the, he teaches a lot of stuff, but he works in the First Baptist Church Ministry. He's the junior high principal. He's written a book called Growing Up in Vietnam, and I've heard him speak several times. And he told a story one time that when he went to war, he was nervous. He was from a small town in Minnesota. Uh, he's a good-sized fella, and he was a pretty rowdy guy, stocky guy, strong guy. But he was young, about uh, eight, about 19 years old. Went for his first tour in Vietnam. As the uh, plane took off and it ended up landing in Vietnam, and he, he got off, he said there was a, a lot of uh, men that were walking uh, one way as his uh, outfit was going another way, and he stopped a guy that was obviously had been, had served his tour, a 13-month tour, and he stopped him and he said, uh, could I ask you a question? First of all, he said, could I ask you a question?